Would you say that you would just experiment then? And you might have an athlete who you suspect would use a deeper dip or maybe a shorter dip. But is it is it really just comes down to playing around with different strategies and, and seeing what works best? Yeah. You could you could use both strategies, right? To see how the athlete feels in that point. But I could say that for example that question in my opinion uh, it's for a like a, an experienced weightlifting coach. I not that figure. What I'm doing is just research to provide this information to a weightlifting coach. And I think that information a weightlifting coach is gonna be like a more appropriate person to 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 reply that. But definitely, I could do that approach. I think that one is good, and you could have very good results doing so. Yeah. Um, we tend to just have our we tend to have our lifters do pauses, different drills. We'll do we'll have them pause in the dip. We'll have them do um, exercises like jerk balances or just things to kind of get them to figure out where that stopping point is at the bottom of the jerk because you can kind of feel it whether it's whether you stop more shallow or whether you stop deeper. There's always yeah. that kind of like. You, my my thing is no matter where you are, no matter if you if you're if you dip more deeply or you dip more shallow, you should have a stopping point. Yeah. Do you would you agree with that to take advantage of that stretch shortening cycle? Uh, in my point, that breaking point, as you defined before, it it's also influenced by like the anatomic structure, as I said depending how tall the athlete is and depending on many things like the elastic properties, the tendon properties, so many things. Like, uh, I'm actually agree with you. In my experience as a lifter, as an amateur lifter, better say, because I'm not as good as you are, uh, and not as a weightlifting coach, but I would say so, and I definitely agree with that. John, what are your thoughts on the, um, the teaching, getting somebody in the push press or the, the jerk, like getting them comfortable with that, with that dip? So I've used uh, some slow tempo stuff. and we've, we've talked before about using a pause. Um, I think one of the big highlights, at least in this conversation, is to understand there's individual differences and it's going to take a little bit of time for not just – the coach to figure out what's optimal for each athlete, but what that let the athlete also kind of feel out what's optimal to them. Um, so when it a with, with the jerk in my experience, creating some form of tempo and getting a lot of reps um, and getting them to feel when they need to put the brakes on it is, is one big one. Um, but then also letting them explore that a little bit and not being like, okay, we well, got to make that quicker. Or you got to you got to stop earlier. Um, is that I've never had success with that. Do you understand what I'm saying there? Yeah, for sure. The other th so depth of dip is one thing, Marco. What about the speed of the dip of a push press or a jerk? I see a lot of lifters in their minds. They think if I dip faster, that's automatically better, just because faster is better. But Sometimes I see that maybe throws them out of position for the actual drive. Is there a – did you guys see any differences or anything in in regards to relevance of the speed of that eccentric dip? You know, that is something that uh, we want to provide you in the future because we are – so we use reflect marks on the bar – and also on the lifter, on the, we place a mark on the sacrum where it's supposed to be the center of mass. In that way, we can study if the markers on the one side, on the sides of the bar, and also the marker of the lifter, they move in parallel and at the same time during the eccentric phase. What we want to know is that 
they move in parallel not only during the eccentric but also they stop together and also like they take the concentric phase or the propulsion phase together if there is no synchronization between these variables maybe imagine that your body center of mass it drops like suddenly then the bars the bar smashes you so it it could be a problem uh, I don't have the, the data yet, but uh, what I could say is that uh, as in the first pull of the snatch and the clean, the lifter must control that the bar is close to the body. And that's why we say that the first pull is slow. I could say that the eccentric part of the, of the dip uh, it has to be at least under control. I'm not going to say slow, right? But it has to be controlled. So if you do it too fast, just because you think you are going to improve your elastic properties, probably the bar will smash you, right? And you will get the opposite effect. So you can that manifest, because I know what you're talking about. They rush the dip. And then what happens at the bottom of the dip, instead of having this still like strong, stable platform that you can imagine, even if there's not 160 kilos on the bar, you can just kind of imagine the bar oscillating and wrapping around the body and then whipping back up. What happens instead is their upper body just kind of folds, their elbows yep. drop, and it, the, all that power just kind of dissipates downward. And they've got very little to spring back up. Be because another thing that was mentioned in your paper is that there's actually an unweighting phase in the dip of the push press and the jerk, meaning the ground reaction force actually becomes less than the system weight for a, a small period of time. So essentially you, you're unloading and then all of a sudden that load, you're absorbing the entire system load all of a sudden. So to your point, you just keep that in mind faster may be better in a vacuum but if it's to the point where it, that weight is overcoming your positioning then maybe you should tempo the the dip down a little bit yeah uh, yeah I, I saw that and there is an unwaking phase and you can differentiate it like in a jump so it's uh, incredible actually and as I told you like it differs depending on the lifter and also depending on the height. So as I told you, like taller lifters, they are able to unweight even like more Newtons than the shorter lifters. And uh, I don't know, like it's pretty cool to see that data and it's very valuable. And yeah, I would say that. So you have to control the face so the bar cannot smash you right but you cannot do it like if it were like a i don't know like a quarter of a squat so slow no so you are gonna perform like an olympic lift so you have to perform it quickly but under control so that's why i talk about optimal time duration blah 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 in the in the paper because it has to be optimal how do you get optimal that's why years and years and years of training are implemented and that's why I think experimentation is important because optimal, yeah. optimal is individual. And, you know, we can say on average, but then when you, when you get down to the individual, there's a lot of variables. There's, there's how far down are you going to dip? How fast are you going to do it? Uh, these types of things.